Let's pray together. Gracious God, we come to your word once again, and we just put before you our lives, our hearts, our activities, our passions, our motives, our priorities, our opportunities, our relationships, our time. We lay them all before you, Lord, this morning and just ask that you would do with us and do with all these things as you will. We make it our ambition to be pleasing to you. And we recognize even our attempts to do that are feeble and frail and small compared to what you are due, compared to what you are worth. And so we just ask even this morning that you would use your word to provoke in us an ever-increasing desire to render every breath and every step on your earth as praise to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this morning we're continuing our study of Romans chapter 14. I would invite you to turn there. And this is part two of learning how to prefer one another in matters of preference, in areas of indifference, in activities, in ideas that are neutral in and of themselves. We can call these gray areas. Uh, we're learning again from God's word how to coexist in gray areas. What does that mean in the body of believers? And really this flows out of Romans 12 that our lives are to be living sacrifices. What does Christian worship look like? It's not just gathering together and singing songs. That is a corporate expression through music of our worship, but the Christian's life is to be a life of worship, dragging the whole carcass of your existence onto the altar and laying it before God, except ours is a living sacrifice. And we live and we breathe and we act together for the glory of God. That is a definition of the Christian life. And how that plays out amongst us in the body of Christ when we are so different from one another. <laughs> how do we who are different people live with our differences, especially in matters of indifference, gray areas, areas of preference? And just as a reminder of what Paul is not talking about in this section, he's not talking about areas of doctrinal deviance, and he's not talking about areas of unbiblical behavior. We are actually to help one another with these things, assess these things. We are to have discernment about these things. And doctrine and biblical behavior matter to God. They should matter to us. But what's under the microscope here in these texts are all those other things. Neutral areas, gray areas, things that the Bible does not specifically address, which are in and of themselves innocuous. And what we're going to discover this morning are four reminders, in addition to what we've already looked at, that will help us in this gray area existence. Let's read together. Romans 14, we'll be covering this morning verses 5 through 12. God writes through the Apostle Paul, one person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. He who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not, for the Lord he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lives, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. I've divided this section up into four reminders, and, and these are things we are to remind ourselves particularly about each other. 
As, relate, as we relate to one another in areas of indifference, what should we be thinking about? And the first one is simply this. We are to remember the believer's God-pleasing motivation. When you think about the believers around you, what should you be thinking when they do something slightly different than you do in areas of indifference? That person wants to please the Lord. That's our first reminder. And we see that in verses 5 and 6. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. He who eats does so for the Lord. He gives thanks to God. He who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. These are such helpful reminders for us as we look around and we see someone in the body of Christ doing something slightly different than we are. And the temptation for us is to elevate our own desires, our own preferences to a law for every other believer. And Paul says, no, that person that's not eating, he's not eating unto the Lord. And that person who is eating, he is eating unto the Lord. This is a really important principle for us in areas of indifference, in gray areas, areas of preference. Our motivation is critical. Our motivation, the the reason behind any activity or inactivity is so crucial. And Paul begins talking about special days, special days. Notice verse 5, one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. This is probably a reference to Jewish feasts, Jewish festivals, fasts, holy days or holidays, and Sabbaths. And Jews and God-fearing Gentiles who had become believers in Jesus may have continued to recognize some of these special days, to even celebrate some of these feasts and festivals in a way to express their devotedness to God. Feast of tabernacles or booths or any of the various feasts recorded for us in the Old Testament would have been very familiar to Jews in Paul's day and Gentiles who had gotten close to Israel and to the God of Israel. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with celebrating these things, but none of these feasts and festivals that Paul is referring to here, none of these days are demanded of the New Testament believer. They're not commanded for us. This is not a matter of obedience or disobedience. This truly is a matter of indifference. There's no condemnation given for the observance of a day in this passage for the believers at Rome. And listen, when you read Colossians Uh, chapter 2, for instance, or the letter to the Galatians, Paul takes a little bit different stance in regards to days and Sabbaths. Because in both of those letters, he's addressing the problem of those who held over Christians the idea that you had to observe special days, either to be in our secret club or to be right with God. And those were a violation of a, of a radically new ecclesiology of Jew and Gentile together in one body, one new man, as Paul calls it. Or they were a violation of justification by faith alone. Look, yeah, following Jesus is great. He's the Messiah. But you've got to do these religious things. You've got to add these Jewish festivals. You cannot be justified by faith alone. You have to be a Jew also. And you notice in the book of Galatians, Paul got very upset with that kind of approach to days and feasts and festivals. And similarly, in Colossians chapter 2, those are much more strongly worded instructions because they compromised the church or they compromised the gospel itself. But here in Rome, these were matters of indifference. They, they weren't being held on to as exclusionary measures for the people of God, nor were they compromising the doctrine of justification. And so the diversity in the expression here was okay for Paul. He would not tolerate gospel compromise. He would not tolerate false teaching. But he did tolerate a diversity of opinion and expression in areas neutral. And in doing so, he's assuming a Christian's proper motivation, which is a desire to please the Lord. Notice what he says in verse 5. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. And that's a preview of the principle he's going to give for us in verses 22 and 23. Look down there for just a moment. He says, happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, 
Because his eating is not from faith, and if not from faith, it's sin. So the preview here is be convinced in your own mind in areas of, dif- of indifference that what you're doing is pleasing to the Lord. If you cannot get there, it's sin. And we'll cover that more fur- fully when we get to the end of the chapter. Now, you and I are a couple millennia removed from the Jew-Gentile tension that's present on every page of the New Testament. But perhaps we have maybe an imperfect parallel in thinking through some of our own holidays. Let's take Christmas, for instance. You walk through the malls and you hear Mariah Carey singing about Jesus and you're thinking, does she love him? This is weird. (laughs) I'm shopping for clothes and there's something seems odd about that. And Christians have lots of different perspectives about Christmas. Some people get really offended when you take the Christ out of Christmas, right? You've seen that? People write Xmas. I mean, technically, I write Xmas. X is the Greek, word, Greek letter key. It's the first letter of Christ. It actually stands for Christ. In my own shorthand, when I write Christ in my sermon notes, it's a big X. So I feel like I'm keeping Christ in Christmas and actually highlighting Christ when I say that. I'm actually more concerned about the back half of the word. I want to get rid of the mass in Christmas, if you know what I mean. But people have all kinds of opinions about this. Some Christians are concerned about celebrating Christmas at all. I mean, it's highly doubtful whether or not Jesus was actually born on December 25th. It wasn't the medieval church calendar superimposed onto pagan Roman holidays so as to sanitize the idolatrous worship of the pre-Christian era? Just make it easy for everybody to be in church. Look, you worship a pagan deity on December 25th. Let's just call that Jesus' birthday and you can keep your festival. I mean, isn't that how Christmas originated? You're thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't celebrate Christmas. Some people feel very strongly about that. I mean, where do we get the Yule log and the Christmas tree? I don't see those in the Bible. And besides, if you rearrange the letters in Santa, it spells Satan. (laughs) I want to defend Santa a little. Can I do that this morning? Santa Claus is actually just a smushed up version of the name Saint Nicholas. Do you hear it? Saint Nicholas, Santa Claus. That's where that comes from. And, and Nicholas was a defender of the deity of Christ at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And just, you know, Santa Claus kind of becomes a hero because Nicholas punched Arius in the nose at the council for denying the deity of Christ. Here was a pastor in the church convened together for a council of church pastors to discuss whether or not Jesus was actually God. There's a problem with that council from the very get-go. And here you have a pastor with disciples and followers who's saying, no, Jesus isn't God, but I'm still going to be a Jesus follower. And, and Santa Claus punched him in the nose. I kind of like Santa Claus. I'm not... Uh, you know, affirming his use of violence at a church council. (laughs) No one is sinning simply for not celebrating Christmas. And no one is sinning necessarily because they are observing Christmas. And, And by the way, this debate isn't new, although it's taken several different flavors. In the late 1500s in Geneva, Christians decided that they weren't going to celebrate Christmas at all most of whom had come out of medieval Catholic Europe through the Reformation and had heard the gospel for the first time, and the Christ Mass was embedded with all the superstitions of medieval Roman Catholicism. And they said, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I I just want to celebrate Jesus. I'm going to remove it, my worship of Christ, totally from this apostate church celebration. And so the Christians in Geneva decided we're not celebrating Christmas and we're not celebrating the festival of Epiphany. That's the January 6th holiday that commemorated the three kings that came and visited Jesus in the manger on January 6th, right? And the historical data there is flawed. Um, there, There weren't three and they weren't kings, they were magicians and I always thought Orientar was a place. Did you ever look for Orientar on a map? Right? We three kings of Orientar, you know, I didn't know where that was. But the, the, the feast of Epiphany is celebrated by baking a cake with a bean inside of it. And you slice, slice up the cake with everybody who comes to the feast, and whoever gets the cake with the bean gets to be king for a day. 
gets a crown and a scepter, and everybody in the household has to do what the king says for the whole day, except the king is required to supply uh, superfluous alcoholic beverages to keep the population happy. Well, the Christians in Geneva said, we don't, we don't really like these holidays. We're not going to celebrate them. They did not condemn other churches in other cities in Switzerland who did celebrate Christmas. And in fact, 30 years later, they reinstituted Christmas. They were able to put the Jesus back into Christmas and go on celebrating. In other words, it wasn't a sin issue to celebrate Christmas or not. It was a matter of indifference. And Christians chose not based on cultural Christian trappings, but based on a devotion to the Lord. And that's the issue here. That's the issue here in Romans 14. The one observing a special day was to be convinced in his own mind that it was right. And the Christian who saw all days alike must also be convinced in his own mind. And again, the temptation is to elevate our own views to the level of law for other Christians. I think it's wrong for me to celebrate the Feast of Epiphany. I don't like beans in my cake, and so no Christians should celebrate Epiphany. We had a visitor come to this church uh, a number of years ago, uh, first question in the door, hi, nice to meet you, I haven't seen you around here before, what's your name, where's the cross, was, was the question, whoa, yeah, we love the cross, we're going to sing about the cross, we do communion every week where we talk about the significance of the cross, uh, the sermon I'm going to preach today, we, we're going to talk about substitutionary atonement, do you love the cross? No, 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 where's the cross on the building? Oh. Well, this was a furniture store, and we just kind of moved in, and I don't know, maybe we'll put a cross on it, but come inside, we're going to talk about the cross all day long. And he said, this isn't a Christian church. Where's the cross? And he was hung up on a form that doesn't come from a, a, a Bible verse. It, look, can churches have crosses? Yes. Um, do, do some churches that, den churches, I just use that word, do some religious buildings in this valley who deny the deity of Christ build their buildings with steeples and no crosses? Yes. Yeah, an LDS ward does not have a cross on the top of the steeple. I don't know if you've noticed that. So, well, we're, we're not that. We should have a cross on our building. Well, there are also lots of buildings in this valley that have crosses on their architecture, and they have abandoned the cross altogether. <laughs> Again, a matter of indifference, but it becomes elevated very quickly to the level of conviction and law and a realm for judgment of every other Christian. And look, the remedy here is to remember other believers' God-pleasing motivation in their participation or their avoidance of Christian liberties. That's the perspective that Paul enjoins for us. Look at verse 6. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord. He who observes, observes the day for the Lord. The decision is one of Godward devotion, and what's critical here is that God's approval is so much more important than man's approval. More than the approval of fellow Christians is this vertical approach, I want to live my life devoted to God, a living sacrifice before Him in everything I do. And there is such a danger here in living to please men, where we begin to live by the fear of men, and it's easy to unwittingly slide into living by Christian peer pressure, right? There's, there's bad peer pressure. There, this is good peer pressure. But if you're not living your Christian life vertically, but only taking on the external trappings, the accretions of Christian culture, they become little layers over your life that, that shape what you do and how you look and what you say and what you eat, and, and, and you're just taking on the, the Christian music and the Christian bumper sticker and the Christian lingo and the, the sayings and the phraseology and the, the behaviors, but have never addressed your heart vertically before the Lord, there is a real danger here. And you can easily be a chameleon blending into surroundings. You start to blend into the habits, the language, the activities of the people around you without even giving thought to why you are doing what you're doing. This is not living under the Lord. This is a Christian cultural life by the addition of the trappings of the people around you. 
This, by the way, is precisely how someone can look like a Christian and then fall away after a time. The externals look good because something's attractive about this group of people and you begin to live for their approval. So you chameleon your way into looking like the people around you while not ever living unto God at all. And eventually that gets exposed. So how is a first century Christian supposed to observe an obsolete Jewish festival? Well, if you did it, unto the Lord, vertically. Not because everybody else was doing it in in a preferential manner, but intentional, Godward choice. If you celebrate Christmas, why? Why? And for whom? If you don't celebrate Christmas, why? And for whom? And you'll notice here in the middle of verse 6, Paul switches the illustration back to the issue of eating. Notice what he says there, he who eats does so for the Lord, and if he doesn't eat, he doesn't eat for the Lord. Uh, Last week I realized that I mentioned cheeseburgers and bacon way too much for one sermon, went way over the quota. Everyone looked really hungry before the sermon was done, and many of you Uh, texted me. I received a barrage of Sunday afternoon texts describing what many of you had had for lunch, and and there were a lot of cheeseburgers in there. I'm going to try not to illustrate too much today with food. But notice in verse 6, the one who eats, eats unto the Lord, and how is that manifested? Gratitude. He gives thanks. This is a really good test. Can I do this and be pleasing to the Lord? Is this truly a matter of indifference? Well, can I, can I pray for this, and can I give God thanks for it legitimately, biblically? And, and this one eats, and he gives thanks. Gratitude demonstrates the Godward disposition. The converse of that, eating without gratitude, it's godless. It's godless. It's godless to walk on God's green earth and eat from God's bounty and not acknowledge him. In all things, give thanks, right? This isn't just about eating. Eating becomes the, 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 the little piece representing the whole of life. Exercising so-called Christian freedoms without gratitude to God is godless. And notice the one who does not eat, it is for the Lord he eats not, and he give thanks. He's not giving thanks for the other guy's food. He's he's expressing gratitude and contentment for what the Lord has provided him, and it means there's no resentment for the guy with a cheeseburger. You can't be thankful to the Lord and bitter about someone else at the same time. This is a matter of being content with what God has provided for you in your decision to refrain from something that might be a neutral issue. Listen, Christians have different perspectives. There's diversity in areas of indifference. We all ought to be motivated by a desire to please the Lord, and it's okay. And we have to learn the skill of seeing through our brother's eyes to do this well. Or we will miss what is really remarkable in our differences. Look, if you're hung up with your brother or sister in Christ because of what they do differently in their Christian liberty, (laughs) you're missing something radical. A supernatural thing has happened. And that person looks different than me, and they want to please the Lord. Don't miss that. And we have to see through each other's eyes to get there. It really is a miracle when a life is devoted to God. There's a second reminder for us in this passage in our life together in the gray areas. First of all, recognizing in each other a God-pleasing motivation. But secondly, the believer's whole life orientation. The believer's whole life orientation. Look at verse 7. For not one of us lives for himself. No Christian lives to himself. Why do we eat? Why do we abstain? Why do we celebrate or refrain? Motivated by the desire to please Christ? This is explanatory in verse 7 because Christians live for Jesus. That's the reality, it's a fact. All of life is to be lived for Him. Whether we eat or drink, we do all to the glory of God. The Christian life lived unto God is to be so all-consuming that the mundane activities of life are turned to worship. We are not to live a compartmentalized life. God gets my Sundays, but the rest of the week is mine. 
Or God gets my devotional time in the morning, I, I put him first, and then I get the other 23 hours and 58 minutes of the day. No, God is to have all of me. His pleasure is to be my aim. I am his totally, and I am at his disposal. That is what it means to be a Christian. And I think it's somewhat shocking the way Paul says this here. These are indicative statements. For no one of us lives for himself. And you're thinking, oh man, I lived for myself this morning at breakfast. I got the last English muffin and left everybody else in the dust. This is shocking. No one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, verse 8. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. These are just statements of fact describing the Christian life. And this is an indictment. <laughs> right? This is a rebuke to us at whatever point we are not intentionally devoting our lives, even in the mundane things, to God. The whole orientation of our life is to be Godward, and so much so that Paul just states, that's the Christian life. Oh, how selfish am I? I think about the last week. Think about your time, your intention, your motivations, your communications, your relationships, your opportunities. Were you thinking moment by moment, God, this next step belongs to you? This conversation is yours. This relationship is in your hands. God, my life is yours. Have you, moment by moment, this last week, been dragging your walking carcass up onto the altar of sacrificial living unto Jesus Christ? It's a tall order. And it is the definition of the Christian life here in this text. These indicatives serve as oughts for us where we see there is a gap between what we are living like and what this text indicates. Notice our Godward orientation encompasses not just our life, but our death too. Paul says no one dies for himself. If we die, we die for the Lord. So no Christian has the right to die for his own purposes any more than he has the right to live for his own purposes, independent of the Lord. We ought to think this way, I would rather die than dishonor the Lord by living selfishly. And if God would see fit, I would rather go on living than dishonor the Lord by dying selfishly. Right? This is obviously a prohibition against suicide. Uh, one of the older commentaries listed this as uh, one of the implications is, so you shouldn't get involved in dueling. You know, you had a disagreement with your buddy? And you both got pistols, and you took paces, and you turn around, and psh, one of you is dead. You know, that, that's not our realm. We, we don't decide things like that. That is selfish. If we're to die, we, we die unto the Lord. We please Him in the way we live. We, we are to please Him in the way that we die. And notice Paul's explanation of this, another explanatory clause in verse 8. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. And then this summary statement, therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. This is possession. We belong to him. I am not my own. I belong to Jesus Christ. God sets the timing and the circumstances of our living. God sets the timing and the circumstances of our dying. If God wants me to live here on earth shorter or longer than I might desire, I am to receive that with gratitude. I do not belong to me. John Calvin said this, If he extends our life in continual sorrows and miseries, we are not yet to seek to depart before our time. But if he should suddenly call us hence in the flower of our age, we ought ever to be ready for our departure. This reminds me of the conversation that Jesus was having with Peter at the end of the Gospel of John. And, and Jesus says to Peter, um, let me tell you about the way you're going to die. It's going to be painful and shameful. And Peter says, well, what about that guy? pointing at John the Apostle. Remember Jesus' response? Well, look, if, if he is to remain until I come back, what is that to you? You follow me. 
And so a rumor came about that John the Apostle would live forever until Jesus returned. That's not what Jesus was saying. John did live for a long time. But our life and our death are not ours to dispense with as we please. We belong to the Lord. I'm going to quote at length Robert Haldane here. He summarizes this uh, in words I I could not um, express uh, without just giving you the quote here. He says, even in eating and drinking, we should have in view the glory of God. To live to the Lord supposes that in all things we regard His will as the sole rule of our conduct. His approbation or His approval of us as our great aim in all that we do. And that in all things we seek His glory. It supposes that we are entirely resigned to His disposal, blessing Him whether in adversity or prosperity, that we submit to His dispensations in what He gives or takes away. And finally, that we only live to serve him, show forth his praise. Whether then the Christian lives or dies, he belongs to the Lord, desiring that he may dispose of him as he sees best, confident that as being the object of the Savior's love, whatever may befall him, he is safe in his hands. End quote. To belong to the Lord is good, safe the best place to be. There's a third reminder for us in living life together in the gray areas. You ought to remember that your brother or sister in Christ has a God-pleasing motivation for what they do. You ought to remember that the whole life orientation of the Christian is to be Godward. And then thirdly, you ought to remember a believer's blood-bought obligation. A believer's blood-bought obligation. This is verse 9. Notice the explanatory statement here, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do we belong to the Lord? Why is my life to be totally his and my death to be totally his? Because he bought it. He bought it with his blood. Jesus Christ purchased the right to be sole governor over my life. In life and in death, he is the Lord. Notice the little phrase, to this end. That is the statement of Jesus' purpose. The the purpose stated here for Jesus' resurrection and continued life is not the only purpose that the Bible gives, but the purpose stated here is that he would be Lord of his people. And listen, that is a good thing. Do you remember what your life was like apart from Christ when you were Lord? (laughs) When you were in charge? When you were driving, how did that go? To have Christ be Lord of your life is so good. And he died, he went to the cross to purchase with his own blood a people for his own possession. That is a tremendous comfort. He says that he did this, he died and he lived. That is, he died and then he walked out of his own tomb and still lives. He has resurrected so that he would be Lord of the dead and the living. He's speaking here specifically about believers. Of course, Jesus is Lord of all, the wicked dead and the wicked living. But here he's talking about believers and Jesus is Lord over the circumstances and the personal care of you while you walk this earth. And he is Lord over the circumstances and is there with you in personal shepherding care as you take your last breath, even in physical death. Jesus himself experienced and conquered death. And he shepherds his people tenderly into, through, and beyond physical death. And speaking of those who have died in faith, Jesus said, God is the God of the living. That is, all those who have died in faith are alive. And Jesus went to the cross and rose from the dead to be Lord over those who were his. Of course, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus' lordship over my life is the purpose stated in verse 9 for his own death and his subsequent life. Your obligation, Christian, is to the Lord because your life is blood-bought. 
Your obligation to him is blood-bought. Listen, we have to remember that. As we think about each other in the context of the local church with differing views about neutral areas, we belong to the Lord, and so everybody's desire ought to be to please the Lord in everything because Jesus purchased that obligation. We need to remember that with each other. There's a fourth reminder for us, and it is believers' final adjudication. Look, who's going to go between you and your brother or sister in Christ over whether or not you should have a meal together on December 25th celebrating Christ's birth that didn't happen on December 25th? (laughs) Who decides whether that's right or whether that's wrong? Well, listen, the day is coming when Jesus will adjudicate. No need for us to judge one another, condemn one another, despise one another, because Jesus, who knows all things, will take care of all of these things. Look at verses 10 to 12. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. It begins with these rhetorical questions. Why do you judge? Why do you despise or show contempt? And remember the temptations we looked at last week. The Christian exercising some liberty is tempted to show contempt for the scrupulous Christian. The Christian who doesn't feel free to participate in that liberty. And the Christian with scruples is tempted to judge the Christian at liberty because he thinks he's sinning in his liberty. And so Paul asks the question, who are you to judge the servant of another in verse 4? The servants are all on equal footing and they answer to the master. They're not to judge each other in their obedience to the master on these indifferent things. So Paul takes up that theme again here in verses 10 to 12. And his answer this time is a clear, direct statement of our individual accountability before the Lord on a future day of judgment. He says, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. This is a reminder to us, first of all, that we are not to be judges of one another in these preferential things. And secondly, a reminder that we will be assessed, each one of us, individually. And you might be thinking, wait a second, I thought all judgment was gone. I thought Jesus paid for my sins. (laughs) The judgment seat that Paul refers to here is the the Greek word bema. Uh, Theologians have called this, therefore, the bema seat judgment. Uh, Bema was simply a raised platform, like the one I'm standing on here, a, a dais for speeches, or it was the place where a judge or a magistrate would be seated to hear cases before an audience and to make judgments. It was a raised platform with steps, and it was lofty and impressive, and it was majestic. Paul wrote the letter to Romans from the city of Corinth, and in Corinth, in Acts 18, we see Paul before Gallio, the proconsul, when the Jews were making accusations against Paul for preaching the gospel. And Paul had to stand before Gallio, who sat on his Bema seat there in Corinth on the raised platform to make judgments. No doubt that image is in Paul's mind as he's describing believers standing before Christ one day for assessment. And he calls it here the Bema seat judgment of Christ. And each one of us will stand for himself. The the verb here for stand has a a self-interest embedded in it. You will stand for yourself at this judgment. You will give account of yourself. You're not there to give account for your brother or your sister in Christ. Jesus, hey, my, my brother in Christ ate a cake with a bean in it. And look at verse 12. So then each one of us will give account of himself to God. An accounting of what? Time, talents, opportunities used and squandered, relationships. Look, there is enough to be concerned with in my own life, in my own heart, with my own motives than to be concerned with judging others in preferential areas. Look, to judge another's 
conscience in areas like this, to, to borrow an illustration, is like a criminal climbing up onto the judge's platform to complain about another person's behavior. But for us to judge and to disdain other believers' behavior in non-essential matters, number one is premature, number two is proud, number three it usurps the prerogative of Christ, number four it's outside of our authority, and number five it sets us who are equals over and against each other, and we are all to be servants of Christ, and we're all to serve one another. We are to leave these things for the infallible judge who has perfect knowledge. Paul refers to this scene in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, same word, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, good or bad. I know it's kind of popular in common Christian theology, unbiblical theology, to assume there is no judgment coming for Christians. That is not the testimony of the Bible. Paul refers to this again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it. It is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, we know for Christians, Romans 8, 1 stands, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This Bema seat judgment is not a judgment of condemnation of individuals. It is the burning up of worthless stuff. It is also the judgment seat of rewards for good deeds. Ephesians 2.10 says that God prepared in advance for us to walk in good deeds. And do you know what he does at the Bema seat judgment? He rewards the good deeds that he prepared in advance that Christians walk in. Well, that is a strange scene. I imagine that we as Christians will stand there at the Bema seat with, with Christ there assessing our deeds, and, and we're thinking about all the wasted time and the opportunities and the relationships and, oh, and, and, and at times, as I've thought about these Bema Seat judgment scenes in the New Testament, I've thought, oh, won't it be terrible to lose all those things? <laughs> no. No. God, thank you that you took the wood, the hay, the straw, that was all the garbage that I contributed to this thing called the Christian life, and you burned it up right before us all. <laughs> and guess what's left? The precious things. Refined gold and silver and precious jewels. What are those things? Those are the Ephesians 10 good works that God prepared in advance that we would walk in them. They're His works. They're produced by His Spirit as the fruit of His Spirit in the life of a believer. And those stand the test of fire and they are rewarded. Can you imagine this scene? Where so much stuff that we spent time doing that was just worthless just evaporates in fire. And then God says, now here are these things that my spirit produced in you. Remember, I only accept the things that I produce. I produced these. I prepared for you to walk in them. And Christian, you walked in them by faith, by the power of my spirit in you. I'm gonna reward you for those things. And what do we think of our God at that point? God, I, wait, wait. <laughs> You're rewarding me for the things that only you could do? That's right, because our God loves to give and give and give and give what is not deserved to the undeserving. That is the Bema Seat judgment. I look, the other stuff, incinerated, it doesn't belong in heaven. We wouldn't want it there. You and I here on earth in this life, you and I do not have the ability to accurately assess precious treasure from wood, hay, and straw. Some of it's more evident than others, no doubt. But there are hidden motives of the heart. There is unseen devotion to the Lord. Plenty of people in Christian history have not let their left hand know what their right hand is doing, and nobody sees it but heaven. The prayers of the saints show up in a golden bowl in the throne room of God in heaven. Heaven knows. 
And in us, the selfishness mixed in with almost everything we do and the, the pride woven into all the things that we do, we don't even see it all. And it's hard for us to assess these things rightly. None of us has the ability to discern these things in the life of another and the way that God sees them, particularly when we're dealing with activities that in and of themselves are neutral. And we ourselves are factories of straw. We are lumber yards and hay barns. There is plenty of work for us to do in this, in our own hearts, regarding our own devotion to the Lord. And we need to remember that a judgment is coming, a judgment of rewards and the burning up of worthless stuff. And every Christian will stand there. And in closing, we need to see verse 11 because Paul employs a text from Isaiah to reinforce this idea that all will stand before the Lord. And the specific application here in Romans 14 is believers standing before the Bema seat of Christ. But I want you to see the, the, the text that he's referring to. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 45. Paul is appealing here to this Old Testament text to buttress the sobriety of this. I mean, when God speaks from a judgment seat, none of us puny people are going to speak up. But we have the audacity to speak up in ways we shouldn't here on earth, even though God sees all this too. And so this Isaiah 45 text invades Romans 14 here to give us a sense of this sobriety. Isaiah 45, 23, second half of the verse, he says, To me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. And what Paul does in Romans 14 is he takes this section of Isaiah 43, uh, he combines the second half of Isaiah 45, 23 with a short phrase, As I live, declares the Lord which Paul borrows from several other places in Isaiah, or it's, a, it's an oath that God uses all over the Old Testament. God will say, as I live, declares the Lord, or Old Testament writers will say, as the Lord lives. It's a way to say in short form what Isaiah 45, 23 says in long form. Here's Isaiah 45, 23. I have sworn by myself the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. And the verb to swear here in Hebrew is probably built on the root for the number seven. I have sevened myself. That is, I, I have sworn solemnly seven times over by my own nature and my own character and my own name and my own integrity is at stake in this. My own self-existent, says the self-existent God of Israel, Yahweh. Uh, which is why the short form of this, as I live, says the Lord, is so appropriate. But I want to back up even in this Isaiah 45 text and pick up the context a little bit. Look back at the end of verse 21. He says, who has long since declared it? And God in this section of Isaiah is comparing himself to all the false gods that the nations were tempted to serve and that Israel was tempted to go after. There's no one like me. That's the theme here. And he says, is it not I, Yahweh, who declares the future and fulfills it? There is no other God besides me a righteous God and Savior, there is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Here, God is proclaiming his own universality. It's not as if the God of Israel was a regional deity that competed with other regional deities. He is the one true God. He is the one who is the only Savior, and he makes invitation to all the nations, come to me, all the ends of the earth, and be saved. The text will conclude with God's promise to Israel. He said, in Yahweh, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. That's a day still yet coming. But in between there, you have this declaration that God is unique, that he is the only savior. Everybody should be invited, is actually obligated to turn to him because he is God and there's no other. And then he says, verse 23, I have sevened myself. <laughs> I have sworn by myself. And he reinforces that with a parallel statement. My word went out, <laughs> my mouth in righteousness, and it does not turn back. And there's a parallelism here in Hebrew that's missed 
uh, in English as well as in the Greek text when it comes over into the New Testament. God says in verse 23, I have sworn by myself that every knee will will bow and every tongue will swear. God makes this oath on his own nature that a day is coming when everyone will swear allegiance to Yahweh. And look, some will swear allegiance to Yahweh in eternity because they have willingly done so in this life and surrendered to him by faith and benefited from his grace. But every mouth that has refused God in this life will swear allegiance to him in eternity, not willingly, but because they will be under compulsion, every knee will bow and every tongue will just freely confess, admit, and say, yes, there is only one God. He is God. They must. And notice how this section continues. They will say of me, verse 24, only in Yahweh are righteousness and strength. There was no other hope in him. There was no other righteousness. I didn't have my own. I couldn't get it anywhere else. It was only from him. And only in him are strength, ability to endure, to to make it in eternity. Men will come to him. All who were angry at him will be put to shame. There's a reference here both to salvation and to judgment. And in this text, a remarkable back and forth between me and him and Yahweh and God And when you get to the New Testament, and this text is appealed to both in Philippians 2, 10 and 11, and in our text, Romans 14, there is a back and forth between God and the Lord. The Lord in the New Testament is Jesus. God is a reference to God the Father. In other words, there's a very close relationship here between what is ascribed of Yahweh in the Old Testament and what is ascribed of Jesus in Romans 14 and in Philippians 2, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confesses. Both of these texts, Romans 14 and Philippians 2, are remarkable demonstrations of the deity of Christ. In fact, Jesus himself said in John 5, God has assigned all judgment to the Son, John 5, 22. Who is it that is on this Bema seat of judgment? And who is it that will be on the great white throne uh, judging the wicked dead? Believers get assessed by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. We are His, our accountability is to Him. And everyone who rejects Christ will meet Christ one day. And when they get assessed, there will be no Ephesians 2.10 category. Oh, I see those good works that I prepared in advance for you to walk in them. No, they will not be saved as though through fire. They will be incinerated by the eternal fire of God in unending conscious torment and judgment that is due them because there were no precious materials. It was all wood, hay, and stubble. It was all man produced and therefore liable to judgment. That day is coming. Everyone will meet Christ. And think about that. The one who himself was judged for sin. Not his own sins, but the sins of everyone who would ever believe. He was judged for them, paid for them in his own body at the cross. That one who was judged for sin will one day be the final arbiter the final adjudicator of all the deeds of every human being who has ever lived. For believers, praise God, incinerating the chaff and rewarding those things that God produced. And for the unbeliever, the infinite final retribution for deeds done in the body. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the judge of all the earth, and we can wait for you. You hold all accountable, and each one answers to you as an individual. None of us skates by on the coattails of our parents. None of us escapes your scrutiny by blending in as a chameleon with Christian culture around us. All will stand before you bare and exposed Lord, we thank you that your blood has covered all who believe and there is no condemnation. And what we have to look forward to in you is a life of pleasure in your 
presence that is in keeping with the rewards that you've promised for obediences here. Oh God, would we use our time and our talents, our opportunities and our relationships to store up treasures in heaven. Give us greater fuel and greater desire to make it our ambition to be pleasing to you. As we relate to one another in the body of Christ, O oh Lord, may we be humble and servants of one another to that end. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.